G as it was um, affectionately known. Uh, w and G was uh, an independent, family-owned department store in Colchester until it was acquired from Phoenix in 2008. After the takeover, I continued in the same role with Phoenix until I decided to make a break for my freedom a year later. I think it is fair to say that W and G was considered amongst its peers to be one of the most successful department stores in the UK and won Department Store of the Year from Drayton's Record for the Fashion Industry Journal. Quoting the write-up to the judges, Williams and Griffin may be an independent department store in sleepy Colchester, but it behaves, operates and generates results that should have big, business, big businesses twice the size taking note. It was a credit to W&G that Phoenix saw it as a thoroughly modern and fashionable store in the mould of the Bond Street store, with a strong management team, which is why it was so keen to acquire it. In fact, although Phoenix had 13 stores in the UK, W&G was the only one which it has acquired in the last 10 years. Uh, Phoenix are unusual, as each store operates completely autonomously with no central buying, and I'm pleased to say that they have retained every one of my buying and management team. Um, W&G, or H.E. Williams, as it was originally known, was an agricultural and, hard and hardware retailer. So this is an example. Actually, these buildings are, are still basically there. This was the front of the country, but this was the high street of, of Colchester. And this was the venerable old man who, who started it. Um, just like you, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we'll come back to that too, but the, the invitation, you know, is... It's, 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 Herbert Williams. Um, the department store was a more recent development when Kenneth Ireland uh, here, um, um, he, he, he got uh, a shareholding um, in, in, the fam in, in the company um, and he amalgamated it with um, several other businesses, a Griffins, a furniture retailer and two other retailers in ladies, fashion and jewellery. He eventually became a majority shareholder and his three sons, Patrick, William and Peter, joined the management and followed in his footsteps as directors. Here are some early slides of what the store looked like back in the 1960s, which is when it really became a department store. And they're wonderful. Um, and um, here is, um, I think, uh, God knows what it is. It's a white goods department, that's where there's really one thing in it. <laughs> that then became our hairdresser. Lots of spare space. And uh, wonderful. It's that sort of um, fashion and um, gowns and such like on our, on our fashion floor, I guess. Uh, and that was, the, the, the storefront hasn't changed that much actually, so it's a bit of a nightmare in some ways, um, uh, which is something else we'll come to. Um, that's a slightly more recent photograph with different branding and done stuff to the, the storefront and, and, and so on. Um, I joined in 1991 as finance director designate. Uh, at that time, Peter Ireland was managing director. I later became the only non-family member to be managing director, and that was in 2000, when Peter decided to retire. I, I arrived originally completely by accident. Uh, I'd made a quick exit from a short career working for a mafia-like shipping company. Uh, and before that, I'd been with a timber trading outfit, which was hugely successful, but I'd ended up suing my parent company, so um, my pedigree was somewhat in tatters. However, I arrived at W&G armed with a degree of self-confidence and belief in my own capability, which was well beyond my confidence. <laughs> I had no experience in retail and had a desire to be a land tamer rather than a chartered accountant in case any of you had seen the Monty Python sketch. Um, I didn't expect to stay for more than six months and considered it was beneath me to work in a shop. But um, I fell completely under its spell and stayed for the next 17 years and loved every moment of it. I've been incredibly lucky to do something that I loved and got paid for it. It's not for nothing, I think, that so many soaps are based on department stores like Are You Being Served, The Paradise, and Mr. Selfridge, as they are a hotbed of activity and characters crammed into an enclosed space where every day brings surprises, intrigue, and outrageous shenanigans. Um, I don't want to pretend for one minute that when I arrived, everything at WG was all wrong, and somehow I put it all right. Quite the opposite. Firstly, it was very much a team effort, and secondly, we had a lot of it right already. 
WMG had a great reputation for customer service. It was much loved by its loyal customer base and by its staff who loved working in a family store with great values where they were treated well, looked after and enjoyed working. However, when I arrived, which wasn't as a result of me arriving, I have to say, but it looks like that, the high street was in crisis. Uh, and we were in a recession. Property prices were falling, negative equity was discouraging people from spending, growth was stagnant, and just to make matters worse, new competition was springing up in all forms, and old independent department stores were going to the wall. WG had rather lost its way. It had no real sense of purpose or destiny. It had an aging customer base and did not try to appeal to younger people or to men. And it was trying to compete on value by selling cheap products, and yet itself was not price competitive. It expected that its customers would be prepared to pay more simply because they were getting better customer service. My observation of this at the time was similar to Blackadder's to Baldwin, which is that it was a great plan with only one flaw, which is it was bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> it, it also seems to me that WMG's main strategy was to hold everything together and stay pretty much exactly the same as it has always been. The consequence being that we ended up investing in our failures. It was only when something started to go wrong and slide that we took action to try and invest resources and try and rescue it. And this applied to pretty good <coughs> as well as departments. It seemed to me at the time, and it was a view I expressed to the director of Alarm, that there were three types of people at the store. Those who thought that the world would continue to be the way it always was and had been. Those who knew the world had changed, but thought it would go back to being that way anytime soon. <laughs> and then there were those who knew the world had changed and would not go back again, but nevertheless they didn't like it one little bit <laughs> and would resist change against all odds. Personally, I felt that the world was changing faster than it had ever done in the past that that change would continue to accelerate and that the only way to predict the future and to stop yourself from going mad was in the words of Steve Jobs was to invent your own future. One of the worst habits looking back was the practice of phased retirement for directors. We were just trying to be nice, but by reducing directors to part-time two days a week for up to three years before finally retiring, it just made the whole organisation moribund and no one could get on and make the radical changes that were needed. The real change came in 1995, when we had at last managed to get rid of the old guard of directors and had established a new, younger management team with two merchandise directors, Julie and Janet. And after a couple of false starts, we set up a marketing department with Lorraine as marketing director. Oh. Lorraine is leaving the WMG tomorrow, and she's becoming UK National Director of Marketing for Clarence, I'm pleased to say. So she's oh, going to be wow. Wow. I'm going to introduce her. And really we decided we were going to, you know, we're going to make big changes in the store, we're going to make it individual, we're going to get a lot of brands in, uh, we're going to do stuff. We decided that we would modernise the store and become more aspirational and fashion-led and attract the leading brands that our customers wanted. We decided that we'd do away with meaningless mission statements involving value, choice and customer service. Or whether it's valuing customers and commitment to service, I, I can't remember. Anyway, we decided we would simply be the most successful independent department store in the UK. We instilled in everyone a sense of mission, empowered them to use their own initiative, established a price promise and a refund without question, all of which scared the bejesus out of the old crew, but galvanised the rest. So this was our team. Even when I was younger, that's me, uh, when we were there. You know, this is Janet, this is Julian, this was Peter, who was um, the family member who was managing the director. And he, he was a great guy, actually. Um, uh, heart absolutely right in the right place, and probably didn't quite know how to make the changes, but he knew that he needed to make the changes. And he gave the team a lot of credit. A pivotal member was that when all members of the management team went on a three week tour of New York and Chicago, this is actually taken in Central Park, uh, along with other members of BSSA, which is British Shops and Stores Association. We had introductions and tours of some of the most influential retailers in the US. Among the department stores were Barney's, Saks, Henry Bendel, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman, you know any of these. And then there were speciality stores like ABC Carpet and Home, Crate and Barrel, Williams Sonoma, Pottery Barn, Bed Bath and Beyond, and numerous others. At that time in the UK, I always felt that we placed a lot of emphasis on our, our gardens and garden centers. 
In the US, they were very much more advanced in their housewares and placed a lot of importance on their homes. I think we've seen this more recently in the UK with shops like Next Home. And, and this, I think, a bit of luck, is a picture of the inside of ABC Carpet and Home. And an extraordinary huge area of old warehouses in Manhattan, as big as Harrods, with an extraordinary and eclectic mix of furnishings. They, they specialized really in turning sort of soulless expat apartments in downtown Manhattan into Aladdin's caves. When the casually dressed MD was asked by one of us where all the merchandise came from, he replied, every piece is unique, but if anybody asks me, we tell them that if they want another like it, we can find one somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we came back with fascinating ideas of what we wanted to do, but more importantly, and I suppose this is a really important point, is we had a shared vision, because we'd all gone. We'd all seen the same things, and we thrashed out lots of ideas between us. We knew things weren't perfect, that we'd have to make changes to them, but we knew what we wanted to do. I think this is a great lesson for any organization. We call this process R&D, which you may think for stands for research and development, but it doesn't. It stands off for rip off and duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> and here you can see some outrageous examples, which have never been openly admitted before. I mean, here you can see, for instance, the interior of Crate and Barrel's flagship store in Chicago. I don't know if you know Crate and Barrel. It's like sort of John Lewis home, but on drugs. You know, it's, 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 just, it's just fantastic. It's very much based, actually, on European and, and English design, but we'd sort of forgotten about it, and they come up with it again. Um, but you can see all the architectural elements in there. And then when we bought a new building and created a new menswear department, uh, the, the, the resemblance is quite remarkable, really. Um, and then again, uh, this was a, a basement of, of a store, which was completely unutilized space before, where they turned it into a sort of young fashion department, and they'd used this um, uh, staircase. Uh, and guess what? We had one just like it. <laughs> 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 it was really great. I mean, this had pipes and everything going everywhere, and, and um, and the cosmetics department was just up here. So just using sort of old space, but creating sort of funky kind of environment where the young fashion was very well. Um, another thing we learned was to bring back theater and entertainment into department stores. In the early 19th century, great department stores in Paris, like Galerie Lafayette and Samaritan, had introduced what they called the democratization of luxury and liberated women by giving them somewhere they could browse and shop unchaperoned. In the US, um, there's a great department store. This is looking up through the atrium of Marshall Fields in Chicago. Uh, and this is actually where Harry Gordon Selfridge cut his teeth. Uh, and when he wasn't offered a partnership in Marshall Fields, finally, at a fairly late age, of course, he came to um, England and he started Selfridges. Um, in Chicago, sorry, and I was saying, you know, he, he was quite a showman himself because. Um, he once, for instance, met Louis Leroux at Dover after he crossed the channel on his plane, and he brought his aircraft back to the store and then exhibited it in the store, creating sort of fun and, fun and excitement. We also decided that shopping should be more than just about the merchandise. And it's just funny how, how we have a picture of a globe in those bits when they're in. But it's about the look and the feel and the sort of vibe of the place as well. And it, it all goes hand in hand with making it an exciting place to be. It's more than just about the merchandise. We should be creating an environment and a lifestyle to which our customers aspire. Um, we also decided to discontinue a number of departments and invest in our successes by expanding departments which were already successful. Here are some examples of what we did. I mean, here, that's a bit more lifestyle. Here we've got a wonderful picture of our, our fashion floor. Um, looking pretty ghastly, cluttered, crowded, horrendous colours, dark, grubby ceiling. Um, here's a picture of the new fashion floor which we created. Um, we deliberately made it with a sort of industrial type of synthetic concrete and floor with this, this is a, a stretched kind of plastic, luminous uh, material uh, which creates a kind of light walkway to drag your eye right down to, to, to both ends of the store. Uh, and the idea was to create an environment where it was completely neutral and, and the, the, the clothes did the talking. And it was a huge success, actually. It, it really worked. 
well. It makes it look a bit clinical here, but in practice it is great. Um, here's, here's what our old bathroom shop looked like. Um, great, great. Um, by the time we'd moved things around a bit, um, this is what it looked like afterwards. You know, a, a wall of um, branded, expensive uh, kit. I mean, then, then people actually, some, someday I need to bought one of these things on KitchenAid and actually cut the lead off it and just put it on the, on, on the <laughs> 350 quid pop and put it on to make it look good, you know? Uh, da 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 um, oh, Cosmetics. Cosmetics. Here, here is a cosmetics department we created. I mean, you're probably very familiar with cosmetics departments where you've got counters with those sort of overmade formula. Girl standing opposite you, know, daring you to buy something. You know? um, we deliberately created ours with what we call open cells, so that you could actually there were little testers everywhere, and little places where you could pop your little bugs and your the tissues and things, and try everything. There were, there, were, there were little kind of pods around where you could have makeup done and have demonstrations and, and such like. But basically, the whole thing was open, and we got that idea very much from uh, Sephora, which I know now is all over the place, but at the time it was just one store. And, in the Champs Elysees in, in Paris. Uh, it was a huge success. I think we're the, we're the first store ever to go open cell in the UK. And also, it's slightly based on there's a shop called uh, uh, Apothecary MK, mm -hmm. across it, you know, and we were very much working on that. So I'm sorry I'm not showing here, but partly because of um, Apothe Space MK, I think it's called, um, uh, we went big time into all the kind of alternative brands of cosmetics, all the kind of um, holistic, you know, organic, you know, aromatherapy sort of type stuff. And actually, it was the, the highest performing department of the whole store, which was quite a departure because, of course, everyone thinks the department store is all about sort of branded cosmetics, when in fact, we were sort of going off piece, really. And, and uh, <coughs> people have copied that, and it's done incredibly well. Um, I'm losing the track here. Um, and of course, it's not all just about the environment, it's also about the brands. Uh, we were incredibly successful attracting brands. I mean, Mac is now sort of, you, you do find it every airport shop, but it's still incredibly difficult to get hold of a, as a brand in a store. And we formed a really good relationship with Estee Lauder um, and uh, they put Mac in as well as several others. And we were very successful with brands like Ralph Lauren, Kant, Hackett, and then on the women's floor. Gee, I'm terrible at women's brands, I'm sorry about this, but you're in one ear and out the other. Um, so I'm not going to try and block you. We had lots of good um, women brands. <laughs> lots of great concessions as well. We had Hobbs, which was a really good new concession, and Arcade Denim, which was extremely successful. So we were replacing things like the Viola and Country Casuals, which were good in their own way, but you know, losing the plot. Uh, and, 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 and more casual stuff too, stuff like um, Crew and um, uh, White Stuff and Jewels. Again, they are not seen as being sort of mainstream sort of department store type um, brands, but they are what women want to wear, what people want to wear. Um, also, we created a lot of activity to promote the store. Um, and here you can see a sort of DJ thing going on now in our young fashion. Uh, here we've got a fashion floor, a fashion show taking part on the fashion floor. S smaller than a sort of big fashion show, but again, dragging people into the store and promoting the store. Um, here we have a, a young actor, you probably know who he is from Hollyoaks, sort of doing signings. Um, and one of the best things Oak did actually, completely spur of the moment, was we, we had a, a bunch of <coughs> uh, sort of world class skateboarders, and we organised a skateboarding exhibition on the, on the roof of our car park, and it was hugely successful. And we, we promoted it by text message, you know, telling the first 300 to come and have. T shirts. I mean, you've never seen people in this department. Those, of course, are all my idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, we completely changed our approach towards marketing. We have Barbie. We complained that we changed our approach towards marketing. We used to do a lot of advertising, but we never knew, we never knew what worked and what didn't work. We didn't know whether it had any impact at all. And I, I, I remember once I, I got a, I had a load of Korean. Um, um, students who sort of come to this big experience. And I put a couple of them on every door, and uh, we, we did an exercise over a few days. And we worked out that on an average day we had, <coughs> we had six thousand people through our doors. At that point, I thought if we can't sell for six thousand people coming to our stores every day, we're just not doing something right. So we changed our approach completely, 
and advertise it. So first of all, promote it in store. And with our marketing department, we could do all the graphics, the light boxes, the point of sale, everything else. And then, of course, collecting the data. So that we could then database market this sort of stuff. You may think, what has this got to do with marketing? Because marketing, this is an invitation which is sent to people to come to Christmas events. We were taking it. We changed our Christmas events, so that we changed from one Christmas event to three. And we took approximately £180,000 in four hours on each Christmas evening. So it's, you know, very soon we're talking serious money. So. Um, and so that completely revolutionized our, our, our marketing and also the way we manage the store. A lot of other retailers used to come and visit the store. And the common question was, um, how did you do your market research? And how did you decide to do that? Well, my answer was, at the time, um, I don't know, it just seemed a good idea at the time. Anyway, it seems to have worked. Well, that's pretty much it. Uh, the epilogue is, is that Phoenix are obviously so pleased with their acquisition that they are currently in the process of spending £40 million pounds to knock down the old agricultural buildings, which, believe it or not, are still there, the ones I showed at the beginning, but they're sort of behind part of the facade. And they're increasing the floor area by 50%. I'm going to create a state-of-the-art store. But here I must admit to being a bit of a fraud, as this talk was supposed to be about modernizing the brand. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that, really. The fact is that I've always felt that the store is just a place where we sold other brands, a bit like the markets of old in Marrakesh or on the Great Silk Road in Persia, an environment where people can suck in the atmosphere and enjoy the feeling of affordable luxury. The real stars of the merchandise, the brands we sold. But then again, the one brand that has remained the same is Willie G. A saying I've always loved is that change is good, but no change is better. So while just about everything else has changed, one thing remained the same. Lots of people said, when we chose it as our website, that Willie G was a defunct old-fashioned name. But I was adamant that it should remain. So Willie G it was, and Willie G it is. I hope, though, now it is not associated with a thoroughly, sorry, I hope it is associated with a thoroughly modern store and not with the comfortable old pair of slippers that perhaps it used to be. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it interesting. I hope it's been relevant. And I hope it's something for you to take away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.